I have to change the mask <laughs> for different purposes. After that, I think I, I wish I could sing what uh, I have to say. It's uh, the natural music that seems to communicate more than words and all the brain stuff. Uh, what I want to talk about today is, is a very simple thing, but a very powerful thing. No, it's not the cure for cancer, as, as we saw there. It's to do with public school alumni, and as it says up there, a sleeping giant. Giant, because there's millions of us. Who went to a public school here? Or at some times, maybe walked past one. Most of you went to a public school. Sleeping, because we haven't done much. It's an extraordinary lump of social capital that crosses professions, trades, good people, strange people, a whole range of types of people that we have a lot to offer. In fact, the, the fact that we've survived, I'm 65, mum thought I'd be dead at 30, and I, I wondered for a while. We've got a lot to offer. Several years ago, our, my old school, Arthur Phillip High School at Parramatta, and when I was there, that was the uh, industrial built. James Hardy, etc., the, the Shell Refinery, all there. We were kids, his dad worked in those places. And uh, anyway, we had a reunion, the class of 62. And a bunch of us, after we stopped lying about what we didn't do at school and all the rest of it, we thought, why aren't we doing more here than just having, you know, getting together every now and then having a few beers? And we distilled three elements that actually has driven us uh, to put some projects together over the last several years for the school. The first thing was that we realised that when we left school, we were like the, the proverbial rabbit in front of the, the Mack truck. We didn't know what was going on. I went to Sydney University and it took me three months to get into the library. I wasn't quite sure where the entry was. And it, when I got in, the actual librarians aren't like the ones today. They were very unfriendly. They like to let you know that you didn't know. And uh, when you're unsure of yourself, you don't like that. And my friends had similar experiences. They were looking for jobs. They went to the wrong places to find jobs. There's no network. Unlike private schools, who have an alumni system that is just second to none. It's admirable. They have a group of people who will see them through, get phone call, can you get me a job? Yeah, sure. They don't even know they're doing it. And I discovered that when I found uh, private school friends who just rang up someone and said, hey, Charlie, yeah, can you? Yeah, no, no worries. I had no Charlie at the end of the phone to, to ring up. But what we did realise that, and we realised, of course, that this is particularly so for kids from schools in socioeconomic areas that are not exactly at the top of the heap. And we know the gap between rich and poor is growing here. But worse than the gap of rich and poor, just money in the bank, if you like, is connections. We, there are a lot of people that are very poorly connected. They can't make a phone call. They don't know what's out there. They don't want, know what opportunities they're missing to miss them. You find out later. And that was our second realisation, is that we had ourselves, over the years, developed our own personal and professional networks. We're quite well connected between us, internationally, nationally. We knew all sorts of people. And we thought, let's try to use that in some way to help the young students, because we figured they must be in a similar position. The school hasn't changed. It's in the same sort of area. And finally, we realised that there was something special about us. We were alumni. We had walked the same walk that these kids were walking, more or less. 50 years ago, we did it but we were in the same classroom, we mucked about in the same hallways and got shouted at by the, not the same teachers, but teachers. That's a powerful tool of recognition. I might be that bearded, round-glassed, um, poor poet, but I went to that school. That's highly significant as, a, as role modelling. Now, so we thought we might be able to supply, if you like, guiding hands, helping hands to these kids as they cross this terrible gap from school to post-school, which is to uni, TAFE, uh, jobs or unemployment. Now, as it's mentioned, I write poetry and I was asked if I could work a poem into this presentation. Um, so yes, I have a small poem. Um, small poems are easier to write than long ones. Um, and I've got to make sure I press the right button here. Technology and I don't get on. Um, I'm not a Luddite, it just it doesn't understand me for some strange reason. Uh, so I have a little poem that captures up perhaps the emotional aspect of what I'm trying to talk about here. And this poem really starts in 1947 in New York where a young woman called Evelyn McHale went to the, um, what's that very tall building in New York? 
the Empire State Building and jumped off. That's a very famous image. That's Evelyn McHale. She hit a limo when she landed. There was a professional photographer nearby and took that photograph. It went on the front page of Life magazine and we would say it went viral today. Just look at it for a second or two. You can still see the posy of flowers she has. She's perfectly arranged. It could be a visualization of a line from a Nick Cave song. The serenity of her face and the order of her clothing and everything else uh, belies the tragedy, the sadness, the depression that in fact she suffered. Several years ago, an Australian poet, Geordie Alberson, wrote a beautiful poem called The Fall about this image. A long poem. A couple of years ago, I wrote a very short poem about my son-in-law playing with his daughter when she was three or four. You know the game, you dandle the child and they turn around and so on and you worry if they're going to dislocate their shoulders. The dad's having a great time, you think, oh, one armless child. But dad's having fun. I read that poem of Albertson's and I took two lines from it and added it to my poem that was rather light. And I think it captures very much what we're talking about. And the poem goes like this. It's called Safe Hands. She falls into her father's arms from various heights. This was the light that hurled her darknesses from her. Hands up in a big hurrah, a one-child Mexican wave, dandling from her father's arms like a trapeze artist before she turns a trick, a somersault of sheer delight. Daddy's here. I can be as dangerous as I like. Well, Evelyn's daddy wasn't there on that occasion. And lots of our kids at school are travelling hands-free. So we thought we'd try to put something together. It's not surprising that, that I've gone backwards. <laughs> that I've now destroyed the whole system. <laughs> I'm putting you guys on your metal. Uh, pregnant silences are very important. We can sit and contemplate. And There's a theory of when you hear a poem that the listener should write their own poem mentally next to it. So get writing. Thank you. Now, unlike the, the headline there, mentors happy to give advice, we started a mentoring program with year, year nine students, not to give advice, but to create channels of communication. And we used our connections, our, our um, network. Who was involved? The school itself, the psychology unit of the Department of School Education, and several um, law firms and accounting firms in Parramatta who provided um, not only mentors, but their boardroom and lunch for an hour of fortnight. This was done under the auspices of the University of Western Sydney, another local player. So we have a number of people playing in this. Many very good things happened there, but I'd like to illustrate uh, two points, if you like. One, two ends of the spectrum of, of mentoring. One young fellow in year 11 told his teacher that year nine was the worst year of his life. He said, had it not been for this mentoring program, he didn't think he'd be there. And he meant be there, not just year 11. So he was rather at the Evelyn McHale end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum was a young girl, as happy as a year nine girl should be, not thinking about anything, enjoying herself. Excellent. After three or four weeks of mentoring, she turned to her female lawyer, Westy mentor, and said, could I do my work experience with you? Now that was something. She not only was starting to think about her future, but she took it into her own hands and she was aiming high. I've done it again. <laughs> Why do you find my embarrassment amusing, those of you that laughed? <laughs> you and the law of, of gravity or whatever. We had another program down under the aegis of um, the University of Western Sydney's Law School. We put a program together that we got originally from the University of New South Wales very generously. We went into um, uh, the uh, legal studies classes in year 10. And who went in but senior law students who were local boys and girls, well, young men and young women. The program was oversighted by their law lecturer. And the key thing there was role modelling. Again, lots of good things happened, but those young people who were uh, giving the seminar were locals. 
So the young kids sitting there were saying, well, uni's not so far away. It's not someone that's come from another suburb, another world, and is telling us about this world. It's one of the guys down the road, dressed a bit like us, etc. Now, there's no point in pressing this button because something very strange will happen. Thank you. Magic. The, um, there's no point in raising expectations and people's hopes and they haven't got the wherewithal to stay at school, to stay at uni, to stay at TAFE. So we thought, this city is full of coffee fascists. Let's, ha let's give them the skills of a barista. And a good Western suburb kid kids can always go to the chat. They had that. They just need to know how to make the, uh, the coffee. We did a great program at a huge discount from a local provi a provider of um, uh, baristas. And these students, a lot of them found work immediately. And one even became an instructor very rapidly. I don't know if his coffee was any good. Um, and you can see here I've been using snaps from um, newspapers. This is from The Australian. Uh, uh, Brad Norrington, um, a senior journalist, came out and did this and put this in as part of the economic um, sections. Could I have the next slide, please? <laughs> Our last program that we've been running is a writer's scholarship fund that um, we thought we'd pull together. You need to read and write, and read and write well, just to survive, of course, out there. But it touches your heart and mind. When I, I must say, when I started writing poetry, I found parts of myself I didn't know existed. I found also I couldn't lie to myself when I wrote poetry. If I wrote anything else, I could lie. But this somehow wouldn't let me do it. So there are lots of elements to writing. There's, just imagine if just half of 1% of public school ex-students got together once a month and said, what can we do for the kids at our local school? It would be stunning. Thank you very much.